Members, I want to welcome you all to this afternoon's committee meeting for the Ad Hoc Committee on a Bill of Rights. And can I remind you all that we are now being broadcast live and this meeting, as with all meetings at the minute, is being held fully virtual. So we currently have got six members uh, joining. We've got myself, Emma Shear in the chair. We've got Mike Nesbitt, the vice chair, Carl Nicole, Mark Durkin, Michelle McElveen and Paula Bradshaw. So I'm go going to move to the first item on our agenda this afternoon, and that's apologies. We haven't received any formal apologies. I note that Christopher Stalford isn't yet in the meeting, but he might join at a later time and at that stage I can see Michelle nodding her head so I'm taking that that he is likely to to join us maybe running slightly behind. So I'm going to move on to the second item on our agenda this afternoon. We have got a, a briefing from the RAISE and Assembly Engagement Team um, on our call for evidence, the survey that we had ran uh, for 12 weeks until the, the 5th of February. Um, we're going to receive a briefing now from colleagues in RAISE and the, and the Assembly Engagement Team. Robert Barry, who is a senior statistician statistician, I can't say that word, from Ray's, and Louise Close, who's our outreach manager um, from Assembly Engagement. So members, there's a briefing pack on this and you'll find that in your pack at page five. So Louise and Robert, I'm going to bring you up into the spotlight and if you want to begin your briefing. Thank you, Chair. Um, and Robert, you're here too as well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, if, um, Claire, if you're okay, I'll start and just run through the, the methodology of how um, the survey was, was promoted and the information was gathered, and then I'll pass to Robert to run through the results of the report. Um, so, the survey was carried out between November and February, to, uh, November last year and February uh, this year. Um, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission provided advice on the development of the survey. And um, we also had Disability Action review the questionnaire to ensure that it was accessible um, for people with disabilities as well. Um, the engagement uh, team and the communications team um, worked together to develop uh, and implement a communications plan to then promote the survey as widely as possible. Um, to complement the survey, there were some materials developed um, along with the clerk of the committee, um, which were designed to help inform respondents about why the consultation was happening, um, what it was about. And we also provided the link to the evidence and briefings that the committee had received. So to, to try to give them some context to um, what the survey was, was about. Um, we had a virtual launch, which I know some of the members attended on the 5th of November. Um, and we had over 30 organisations attended that. Um, after that um, launch, the survey link was then issued over 4,000 um, charities that um, we had collected the information from the, the registered charities, the, the Charities Commission, which then which represented all um, Section 75 groups and a wide section of the Northern Ireland community. Um, the Assembly Communications team um, then developed a social media campaign. Um, <clears throat> which launched with there was 109 separate pieces of content that they developed, so you know a, a large amount of social media content there, um, which was published across our three main social channels, which is Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, ads were targeted towards those audiences, um, as identified in the communication plan, um, which you would have seen back in September, um, and uh, those with an interest in human rights. The social media content was seen um, over 380,000 times during the campaign. Um, in addition to social media, we also um, the consultation also received coverage uh, in the Belfast Telegraph, the newsletter, the Irish News, and it was on BBC Good Morning Ulster as well. Um, we also utilised some of the other work that the Assembly um, has done over the last number of months to, to link the Bill of Rights inquiry to that work. So, for example, um, uh, the engagement team ran a project for International Day for People with Disabilities, um, which was viewed over 100,000 times on Twitter. Um, and we had the survey linked to that uh, campaign as well, too, and there was 1,700 engagements with that, so that's you know, people liked it or, or clicked it or retweeted it. So the coverage from linking the, the other work that the Assembly is doing with Section 75 groups to the Bill of Rights inquiry um, meant that it, it reached a wider audience. For those unable to answer the survey online, we're, we're aware that there are those that are, are digitally get disengaged in this. You know, was difficult because of COVID. Um, our, our options for face-to-face -face interaction 
we're, we're actually using our own. Um, so we made the um, survey available on hard copy. And we also offered that we, we would be available for people to complete over the telephone. Um, the survey is also available in other languages on request, and um, the number of surveys were completed in Irish. Um, the engagement team also worked with a number of organisations to help um, uh, issue the survey. And if, just to give you some examples of those, we worked um, directly with AGNI to ensure older people who we assumed would, would be one of the sections of the community that would be um, more impacted uh, by, the, by COVID, the COVID restrictions because they'll be less digitally engaged. Um, so we worked with AGNI to get them to complete the survey. Um, we had hard copies sent to their day centres for completion and, and um, AGNI's team supported uh, the older people to complete those surveys and posted them back to ourselves to enter online. Uh, we also had hard copies issued to some of the food banks as well. Um, we had we had over 40 surveys, a hard copy survey returned to us. Um, I also just wanted to mention as well that many of the third sector organisations, particularly in December and January, ran events um, in conjunction with the Human Rights Consortium um, to help inform those they represent about the inquiry and encourage participation in its completion. Um, and that was from a wide section of different organisations, everybody from NICFA through to um, uh, the women's networks as well. Um, and then there was also some other third sector organisations as well that supported those who they represented by helping them complete the survey. So, for example, the Red Cross, uh, we worked with them to workshops with translators to gather the views of refugees and asylum seekers. Um, and Positive Futures has also reworded their survey for, for people with learning difficulties. Um, the survey was also mentioned that there were 25 uh, Northern Ireland Assembly uh, uh, and training events that we run through the engagement team to encourage participation. And throughout the time, um, the engagement team and the communications team monitored the Section 75 data and the responses. Uh, additional information was sent to underrepresented groups to um, ensure that either by phone or email or social media to ensure that they had the opportunity to have their voice heard as well. So um, in total, we had 2,346 responses were received. Um, and um, I'll pass to Robert now to um, go through a summary of the results. Okay, <clears throat> thanks Louise. Am I on there? Okay, Caroline, yeah. Sorry, Chair. <laughs> Um, yeah, as we said, there were like almost two and a half thousand responses uh, to this survey. So very impressive response and uh, a lot of hard work by the engagement uh, team to achieve that. So I'm really impressed with that. Uh, I would just like to uh, caveat to what I'm going to say. I, I, mean, I was given the task of crunching, doing a lot of number crunching. This. I've uh, um, produced a lot of figures. But I would just like to say that uh, because we're talking about a non-random sample, as we are with all of these consultation surveys, um, in any case, uh, you cannot generalize any of those figures to the, uh, the general population. So you really have to you have, really have to confine um, <clears throat> you know the, the figures to the, the respondents. We're talking about the respondents to the survey every time we talk about comparison between different groups and so on. So uh, bearing that in mind, um, uh, I would actually place a higher value on the qualitative data um, in this survey because you cannot use statistical analysis whenever you have a non-random sample such as this. So you can't look at, you can't talk about statistical uh, differences and so on. But that said, I think the, the figures are still useful and provide a, a useful indicator of differences between groups. Uh, that are likely to exist in the pop wider population. Okay, so the um, <clears throat> first question that was uh, asked in the survey was uh, about uh, whether or not uh, everyone in Northern Ireland today enjoyed the same basic human rights. And uh, the majority of people disagreed with that statement uh, and felt that people didn't enjoy the same basic human rights. And um, the... Uh, it was males, Protestants, and older age groups were more likely to agree with the statement uh, than um, other groups. But um, again, they were all uh, more likely to disagree with the statement generally. 
Uh, and the main reason given for disagreeing with the statement was the existence of inequalities and discrimination. Now, I don't know whether it helps if I refer to tables within the report. Has everybody got a, I don't know whether you all have a copy of this report in front of you or not. Um, it might be useful. Uh, table one on page four actually um, looks at all the, the differences between the different groups. And uh, table two goes through some of the reasons uh, for disagreeing with the statement on page five there. <clears throat> so, um, does, uh, if we move on to the, um, the, the question on protections, where people felt that, that more protections were needed. The, the five areas that uh, emerged that was the top five were disability, age, religion, culture, background, and ethnic group um, emerged as the, the top five areas that, that were viewed as needing further protection. But um, if you look at uh, tables four to 12 there um, in the report, then uh, you will see that uh, there are a number of differences between groups and uh, particularly between age groups and that sort of thing. Um, and again, the community background differences. Uh, human dignity, mutual respect and justice emerges as top three foundation values that people uh, identified. Uh, table 13 and page 13 gives a breakdown by the different groups for that. And um, in general, 80% thought the Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland was important or very important. So that's quite a large majority. And this actually um, agrees quite well with the Ipsos Murray survey that was carried out about 10 years ago. Uh, they found that 83% of their sample um, actually found um, they thought that the Bill of Rights was important or very important. So a uh, large majority, and I was only 6% thought it wasn't important at all. So there are differences between groups once again. Females, under 55s, um, Catholics, those with no religion, and minority groups. Um, all felt uh, you know, attached more importance to the need for uh, uh, a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. But again, no matter which group anybody came from, the majority of all the groups felt that this was important. That's a key point. Also, 88% um, that agreed the Bill of Rights should include civil and political rights, and well, it was over 80% with all these areas here. Uh, was also majority also felt that it should include social, economic, and cultural rights and environment, environmental rights. So uh, all of those uh, areas were um, felt uh, people felt that they should be included within a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland, and. One of the key things I mentioned about the qualitative data, I've tried to um, reproduce a number of quotes um, from um, the data that was gathered. There, there are an awful lot of comments. I mean, you're talking nearly two and a half thousand people here. Most of them had some sort of comments to make. Uh, so um, I tried to capture the wide range of issues and the many diverse views that were expressed within the uh, comments that I've reproduced. Um, but there are many, many more comments, and um, I, I've, uh, I've tried to make it as representative as, as possible of uh, the, the issues that were raised to, to try and cover everything. So that, that was the idea behind uh, producing those uh, quotes. So really, I think you need to trawl through some of those and uh, have a, a you know, to get a feel for uh, people's um, diverse views and the, the wide range of issues that were raised. I, I think you know just about every issue you could think of was raised in this survey, um, and you know many of them conflicting, obviously many view conflicting views. Uh, so. I think the uh, committee has a, a real challenge ahead in trying to uh, reconcile um, all of these um, diverse views and uh, and issues. So I'll, I'll throw it open for 
questions then, Chair, if that's, or well, I'll leave that to you, throw open for questions, I should say. <laughs> Thanks to you both. Thanks, Robert and Louise, for that. Um, that's useful. Um, to be honest with you, I don't have that many questions because I feel like this um, evidence base is something that we as a committee are going to rely on and use. I mean, I suppose it hasn't told us really anything we didn't already know in terms of overwhelming support for a Bill of Rights, the key issues that we know have been identified by both the sector and, and by organisations that are working on this as you know, the, the gaps in, in rights currently. So I'm content enough. Uh, I'll, I'm going to throw it open. I can see Paula indicating. I'll go to Mike first as the vice chair, and then I'll bring you in, Paula. And if anyone else wants to come in, I can see Christopher has joined us. So welcome to you, Christopher. Mike? I'm not seeing Mike. He's maybe dropped out. Paula, do you want to go ahead? And if anyone else wants to ask a question, just indicate. Um, thank you, Chair. No, it's really just to thank um, the, the staff and their work in this. I think it was really, really well put together. I actually flicked through it last night. Um, I thought it was really, really encouraging for, for our work. You know, it gives us real impetus to, to move forward on it. I suppose what occurred to me in terms of even when you break it down by um, political affiliation, unionist, nationalist. I, I would say that if we, if the same survey had been done maybe 10, 15 years ago, I don't think there would have been quite the same support within the unionist community. But I, I think that it was very encouraged that there was widespread support regardless of background. And then secondly, the issues like disability rights, I think that some of the the um, quantitative stuff that came through on the survey very much backs up what we've been here in terms of our evidence session um, during committee time. But no, just really to thank the staff for the work on it. It's very, very impressive. No problem, Paula. Thank you. Uh, I know that Mike is... I'm uh, back on. Sorry, yeah, Mike. Yeah, couldn't unmute myself. And I just want to echo the thanks to, uh, to Louise and Robert. Um, I think there's a lot to be to be studied over over Easter. I'm very struck by uh, the fact disability is coming out top in just about every every category. Um, so it's going to be, I think, very very useful for us uh, when we stop gathering our evidence and start our deliberations. So thank you both very much. That's fine, Mark. Please. And I can see Carol turning on her camera, so I'll bring you in next, Carol. Thank you, Chair. I suppose uh, just to echo those words of thanks to the officers who, who have compiled this report. It's pretty extensive and it's also pretty impressive. There'd be a lot on it sort of for us to, to go through and to mull over, but uh, thank you for that. I think that the, the one point of note is that the overwhelming uh, majority of, of, of respondents have have agreed on the importance of a bill of rights so so i think that, that, that that's really good to see absolutely carl go right just uh, just the same just ending on that i i completely agree with the comments from every other member i think it's really impressive it's a good evidence base for us to progress um Right, we're not surprised at the findings. It's also good to see that we have the data to back up our own experience. So well done, Robert and Louise. Um, and thank you. Thanks. All right, that's brilliant. I don't see any other members indicating. So just want to echo the thanks of, of everyone and appreciate the, the workload. And we, we shouldn't neglect to thank Caroline in that as well because I know she was heavily involved and obviously there's a team working on this. So uh, it is an, a, a, an impressive uh, evidence base and took a, took a lot of effort to get us there. So I'll let Robert and Lee drop off now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, members. We're now uh, moving on to the third item on our agenda for this afternoon, and we've got a briefing from Nikki. So we've got some members as well as Kula. So uh, if broadcasting can bring the panellists up into the spotlight, I can see there we have Natasha Man Manganaro. 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 I hope I'm yep. pronouncing your name right. It's fine. And we have other members joining us as well, so we'll give them a second to come up into the spotlight. 
So this afternoon we're going to receive a briefing from Nikki, who obviously um, is the Commissioner for Children and Young People, um, on the, the youth panel as well on children and young people's rights. Well, I just start with just very quickly. Then uh, I'll hand over to um, to Hannah, who's gonna who's gonna kick off for us. Just to say, just to thank the panel for um, inviting. Uh, sorry, thank the committee for inviting our panel to speak with you today. We've had some technical issues because some of them are at school. Thankfully, so uh, the, but the, the, the four of them should all join. I just also want to commend the committee for responding so positively to our call last summer when we spoke to you and gave evidence to you with regards to hearing the voice of children, young people, and, and just say how grateful um, the Nikki team has been to the Clark and her team at, at, at trying to be proactive and respond to our recommendations and suggestions about how to engage with young people. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over, I think I'm right in saying it's Hannah first. Kula, thank you very much. And apologies, I hadn't seen even yourself in the spotlight there. She was, I should have introduced no you. Hannah has dropped off. We just have Natasha at the minute, unless other members are there and I just can't see them. So, yeah, so I'm here. I'm here. Oh, oh. Hannah, they're there. Emma, they are there. Yep. All right. My apologies. <laughs> um, on the 20th of November 2017, Nikki Youth Panel facilitated, facilitated over 1,500 children and young people at an event to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the UNCRC. This was an event close to my heart as I had been um, doing a placement in order to uh, help organise that these children and young people know, know that they have rights, they know who is responsible for delivering them and they are prepared to act as right defenders to claim rights for them and their peers. Part of that summit was Part of that day was a summit where eight children and young people talked directly to representatives from major parties including uh, Mr Salford about how the incorporation of the UNCRC would make a difference to the lives of children and young people in this country. Each of these politicians agreed that incorporation was the right choice. We are now asking you to take that step by incorporating the UNCRC into the Bill of Rights, showing children and young people that you are putting them front and centre and have their best interest at heart. On the 16th of March, the Scottish Parliament voted unanimously to incorporate the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Children into Scottish law. This is backed up with a financial package of over two million over the next three years to make this a reality. By taking this action, the Scottish Parliament has said very strongly to children and young people, we value you and we will always act in your best. Children and young people are now asking, what is the Northern Ireland Assembly doing to make sure every child and young person in this country can fully enjoy all of their rights at all times? Through fully incorporating the UNCRC in the Bill of Rights, you have the opportunity to show children and young people in Northern Ireland that they matter just as much as their counterparts in Scotland. Studies carried out during the pandemic, including the NIU's Forum Our Voices series, the young people Young People's Wellbeing Council and Secondary uh, Students Union of NI Mental Health report show that young people in Northern Ireland feel that they have been an afterthought. We have received little information targeted at us and few opportunities to show our views directly with those making decisions. Many children and young people are losing faith in the, in the political leadership of this country and we do not have an opportunity to those who generally please incorporate the NCRC into the Bill of Rights. This will show young people that you are putting them front and centre and this will make the future for the children better. Thank you, Hannah. Has anyone else get, given us a presentation or do you want to jump straight to questions? Natasha's next. Emma. The four, the four of them are going to speak. My apologies, Natasha. So, how will incorporating the UNCRC into the Bill of Rights benefit the lives of children and young people? 
Article 28 states that children and young people have the right to education. Education is a key element within the lives of children and young people, regardless of the past year's disruption. Not only this, a beneficial education and system which helps to fully develop their skills, talents and abilities is not being met. At our Children's Rights Summit, we heard from young people about the importance of integrated education, the impact of period poverty, along with children who need stay at home due to illness in classroom activity from using digital technology, the importance of supporting mental health in special schools and the impact of climate change. We have many examples of artwork and pledges that show us that children and young people are demanding that you protect their rights. It's not just children and young people who are watching. We are now entering a new phase of reporting to the UNCRC committee on how the UK is upholding the rights of children and young people. The last report in 2016 presented some of the ways children and young people in Northern Ireland are being let down, including the need for integrated schools, delayed action on bullying, and a need for inclusive relationship and sexual health or education. In fact, may I note that the majority of schools in Northern Ireland are able to skim over this topic, bringing in a group called Love for Life, who reportedly encourages abstinence. Few schools highlight the importance of consent, and according to the website Stonewall, England, Scotland and Wales have all already, or are in the process, of ensuring LGBTQ plus inclusive sex ed is included, whereas in Northern Ireland, schools are under no obligation. What's more, we have seen little improve movement on these issues, no student should experience any form of bullying due to their background, race, gender, identity, sexu- sexuality, etc. Education isn't just about one or two rights. All rights need to be upheld to ensure children and young people can get the most out of their education. They won't be able to if they are hungry or unable to go to school because they can't afford sanitary products, although one of our members of Nikki's youth panel had to, has done substantial work on campaigning for access to free sanitary products to be available in schools, or can't engage because they aren't receiving proper mental health care. As one 11-year-old boy put it, no child should go hungry, and it shouldn't be up to a footballer to point it out. We are looking to you to take this opportunity to uphold the rights of all children and young people by fully incorporating the UNCRC into the Bill of Rights. Thank you. Another issue that is unique to Northern Ireland in terms of protecting children's rights is the legacy of the conflict here, and we know that the committee is a result of this. While children and young people growing up now have all been born after the Good Friday Agreement, we continue to be impacted significantly by what came before. This is particularly important in the the youth this year as a context as the centenary of Northern Ireland and the workings of Brexit and the Northern Ireland Protocol. In December last year, we held an event which I myself find in personally enlightening as part of the Human Rights Festival, where we explored the importance of children and young people being able to celebrate their cultural identity without impacting the rights of others. We need support for our political and community leaders to be able to do this safely. By looking at celebration of culture and identity as a right for all of us makes it safer. Full incorporation of the UNCRC will ensure children and young people that they would be protected from violence and trauma, tackle the mental health legacy and make sure that children and young people's services were properly funded in all communities. We would also like to have opportunities to learn about our past and develop a shared understanding of what's happened so we can ensure it doesn't happen again. At our Children's Rights Summit in 2019, one young woman top, talked about the importance of Article 7 and 32, right of a national identity. Realising that in Northern Ireland, where we can be British, Irish or both, has become more complicated as the UK has left the EU. We want you to make sure that we can continue to enjoy this right and that none of our rights will be impacted by Brexit. Children young people have been rights defenders throughout the conflict here and we will continue to be as we develop a shared future. We just want support in that. Incorporating the UNCRC into law through the Bill of Rights will give us that support. Rights are universal, indivisible, interdependent and interrelated. All children and young people need all of their rights all of the time and the best way to do that is full incorporation of the UNCRC. We can see from the examples of education and dealing with the past that rights are not standalone issues. By not being able to fully enjoy any one right, many others can be impacted. Children and young people have a right to have a say in decisions that affect them. They are clear that their rights matter to them and they've used their voices to give us this message strongly. Now it is the duty of the people in a position of power to do all they can to make those rights a reality by putting them into law. Our November 2019 UNCRC celebration took the theme of UNICEF's campaign for every child, every right. We heard a clear call from nine-year-old Tegan at the summit for politicians to do the right thing 
and always act in the best interests of children and young people. She talked about rights not being a privilege or an honour. It should be, as it is in name, a right, an inevitable right that we all have from birth. The development of a Bill of Rights is a great opportunity to incorporate the UNCRC. This is the best opportunity we are likely to have in the next two to three years. And as we build back a better future coming out of COVID, there has never been a time when we need children's rights to be incorporated into law more. We don't want to wait any longer for our rights to be made a reality. We've had 30 years of the UNCRC being a nice idea. And now it is time to finally make it a reality for all children and young people by fully incorporating the UNCRC into law as part of a Bill of Rights. Pilla, are you summing up? I'm not summing up. No, no, I think they've spoken. I, I may sum up at the end. My role here is to make sure the committee behave because I know my young people will. So I'm just here to support the young people. And so they're, they're ready to take your questions. I may I may say a few words at the end, uh, um, if that's appropriate, Emma, but it's over to you and the young people to have a conversation. Brilliant, thank you very much. And I just want to um, thank all the presenters um, prior to the uh, meeting started or prior to you being brought in, I hadn't got you all in my spotlight. So I just want to formally welcome Hannah Sabu, Kira Fetz and Madeleine Wilson. You weren't appearing on my on my screen at the stage, so apologies for, for that. And thank you all very much for your strong presentations. I have a question uh, around the impact, I suppose, of, of COVID-19 on our young people. And we've heard time and again that our young people have been probably the most proportionately impacted in terms of loss of education, the loss of social life and things that we normally associate with teenagers and, and young people and the restrictions having a bearing on, on your sort of life lessons and development outside of, um, of, of school as, as well as within it. So I wondered what a Bill of Rights and having a Bill of Rights uh, could have improved in terms of the things that we've lost during this pandemic and if there was anything you wanted to highlight there. Well, well, I can answer that. No one else has anything. But I think children would have felt, I think just people felt that they were pushed to the side and that sort of children's, children's rights and their opinions just felt as an afterthought, like we highlighted just there. And I think if um, the NCRC had been there, people would have known that, like children, young people would have known that legally that their voice mattered rather than just having to be the afterthought that it was actually written down and that really it was respected. But yes, if anyone else has anything they want to say on that matter. Does anyone want to talk about how COVID has affected you um, or affected young people um, and how you think things could have been different? Well, in regards to education, um, it's definitely certainly caused me and other exam year groups an immense amount of stress with not knowing what is happening and how we're getting graded. Some of us, actually, we are all still unsure of certain things. So in, our event, in that relation with COVID, we wouldn't have had this much exam uncertainty and this much anxiety around um, around exams, especially with the majority of us needing to get needing to get decent results for for unis and any other further further education. Yeah, is anyone else looking to come in? I suppose I wanted to draw in as well in terms of like so what you've highlighted there around exams, but the impact on young people's mental health throughout all of this. And we know we can see the social media as a tool for the positive and it has allowed us all to remain connected with friends and family and loved ones in, in far from places throughout this pandemic when we can't travel physically. But I, I'm always conscious uh, uh, sort of of the... The impact of you know social media bullying and people trying to aspire to unrealistic body types and images and all the, the sort of unattainable messages that sometimes it can send us and the impact on our young people of that. And how having a Bill of Rights as an accountability mechanism and as prioritising people's rights and equality and making sure that everyone has the same access to services could counter that in some way. Yeah. Go ahead, Hannah. 
Uh, Kira, um, sorry, I can see Kira. Do you want to jump in? Oh, Kira, if you want to go first, go ahead. Oh, no. Um, no, Hannah, you go first. I was actually trying to fix the screen here so it wouldn't let me unmute the start, but you go ahead first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the UNCRC, in terms of social media and the impacts of it, the positives or the negatives, uh, would put concrete what the rules would be. I mean, there was a uh, uh, Nikki. Yeah, 2019 and the subject that we're talking about it was all about the digital rights that we had and although that we know that we have these but putting the UNCRC into the Bill of Rights would just make it concrete that like building on social media any type of um, discrimination would not be tolerated and it would just reiterate that point over and over again so that children could feel safe. Go ahead. And now just to cover what Hannah said there as well, um, through COVID, our entire trust with the government, the relationship almost feels like it's completely broken down because it's like, again, to repeat, we felt like an afterthought. So by having the UNCRC into the Bill of Rights and by having it into law that we can get help for our mental health and we should get it as soon as possible even. It will redevelop that relationship and help each and every individual as well. And actually, I'm um, just as a thought, Nikki, um, la a couple of years back, we actually did a research on how uh, we all, several of us did a social media de to detox. Me and Hannah, I remember both of us did it. And just to see um, out of interest, the impact it had on mental health. And I'd say any of us who did it, found it very beneficial to to take off from social media so we are definitely aware of the impact social media can have on mental health as well as the benefits it has for um social and connection thank you oh sorry i was just gonna jump in there um yeah i think young people during the pandemic have certainly been almost exploded in a way that they've had to they've been bombarded with images of what's been a difficult time for everyone of ways to improve themselves and talking about how to how to growth of course which was important during the pandemic but people felt this pressure to to meet standards which were unrealistic which perhaps were being sponsored by people from celebrities or just social media outputs and that was very dam damaging for a lot of young people's mental health in a way that they couldn't they couldn't go online which should be something kind and something enjoyable and it just became almost just it really made them feel really bad about themselves in a way and their mental health just went downhill so yeah thank you yeah take on board all of those comments um i'm gonna pass now to the vice chair mike and then i've got carl paula and mark chair thank you and thank you hannah and natasha and kira and madeline i i have two questions but can i also say to the commissioner that this committee always behaves <laughs> on camera. <laughs> I, 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 I'm just here to, to make sure you keep up to your usual standards. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I have two questions. One is specific to Natasha. Uh, Natasha, you mentioned integrated education, and I'm just wondering whether, by what you mean, you would like to see more universally accessible access to integrated schools yep. as a sector, or, or whether you would like to see a single education system that was fully integrated. And, and the second question um, is, is to the other three contributors who were all very clear about the UNCRC, but maybe I could direct this one to, to Hannah, because Hannah, you said you were losing faith in politicians, and I'm wondering whether that's because of what we are failing to do such as incorporating the UNCRC into a bit of rights, or whether you're also losing faith in us because of some of the things we are actually doing. So, so maybe Natasha first, Hannah second, please. Well, I personally go to an integrated school, Shimon Integrated College in Newcastle, and I personally think it's excellent. I don't see the need for segregation, not in this day and age. We are simply highlighting the fact that the troubles happened and that um, the the divide still exists whenever we could have just integration and in regards to that um the universal um the one system this was actually a topic we were discussing with a number of other young people um and a vast majority agreed that 
it would be a lot simpler if there was just a universal one-way system, one system of education. In fact, Northern Ireland, I don't quote me on this, but it's probably one of the only places that has this many different variations. Like we've got grammar schools, we've got, um, we've got integrated schools, we've got um, just... We've got a very a large amount of different schools. There's not really much need for them anymore. If there ever was, I don't know. But I definitely am very pro integration. I, yeah. That's very clear, and and I think by and large, I absolutely support you, Natasha. Thank you. So, thank you. Hannah, is it what we're not doing, or is it what we're not doing and what we are doing? Uh, it's a bit of both. You're. Uh, I, children feel like you're not doing enough to hear our voices or not even not even um not just not trying to hear our voices but it's it's the fact that we try to raise our voices and we feel like we haven't been listened to and it's not just um what you're feeling today especially not if in incorporation of the uncfc but it's are doing and pension being we we feel like our our future um has been put in has put our future has been um used as a weapon as we're against this one we're against this one especially with education um the education abortion any like serious issue it's it's the old um it's been the old arguments using these kind of con it's like the old generation and uh, the, um, the the political and religious um, opinions have been t overtaken our views and what we want is is a peaceful and progressive country. Thank you, Hannah. Actually, on Hannah's note, can I just make a comment? Because you mentioned something there, which I'm going to throw something in. Way at the start of the pandemic in March um, last year, um, one of the a DUP politician actually said blamed COVID-19 on the legalization of same-sex marriage and abortion, which, yeah, yeah, says something. It does. Um, Kira or Madeline, do you want to comment or, or should we move on? I think Han and Tasha covered everything perfectly there, in my opinion, but Madeline, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I was just wanted to say the thing that I feel like young people have sort of been made into the villains of the pandemic like it sort of been any point that people have been blaming about another lockdown coming it's always been young people despite the fact that we've been disproportionately affected in terms of exams stress and everything and the fact that at one point yeah one's sympathetic towards towards um towards young people in terms of exams and in the next minute it's just anyone and saying that young people have done the absolute worst but yeah i think uh, and Natasha really covered everything else beyond that point. Perfect. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Chair. No problem, Mike. I'm going to bring Carol in. Hi. Um, thanks very much, everyone, for your presentations. Um, I, I just want to point out, I'm keeping my camera off because my computer keeps saying that my internet is unstable and I'm afraid of dropping off. We, I had this problem with the Health Committee this morning. Uh, and like Mike, I had to go back out and come in again because I couldn't unmute. So I just want to say that in case you think I'm not interested, because I am. Um, I'm not going to argue with what you've said. I mean, that's your opinions. And I would support a lot of what you've said, to be honest. I believe without a strong Bill of Rights, we already have Section 75. And if every single minister implemented Section 75, we would have better equality and a better sense of inclusion than what we do. So it's quite clear that they don't. So a Bill of Rights, and I don't know if you heard the previous presentation, I would say over 80% of people want a Bill of Rights. And we had a presentation from the Northern Ireland Youth Forum and again, strong advocates for children and young people's rights and used examples in Scotland and Wales and asked us to do similar. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I appreciate everything that you have said uh, and just, a, you know, as someone who was in a department um, during part of the COVID, um, I was very much aware of particularly marginalised groups um, 
such as children and young people, but also older people and LGBTQ+. And I suppose just in my own defence, did as much as I could to ensure there was as much inclusion as possible and that it wasn't tokenistic, it was actually real. And just to say on the issue around COVID, um, I mean, the young people in my community in North Belfast, right across the community, were part of the first responders. They were the ones who went out and delivered period poverty products. They delivered food parcels, were involved in their sports clubs. They were working with their youth clubs, as you know, all within COVID regulations. But um, the work that Carol, we can't hear you. I don't know if your internet has broken up or... Michael, you are... I'm going to bring Paula in and then Carol's going to jump out and come back in and we'll allow her to finish your question. Paula? Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, um, for coming along today. Very, very impressive. Um, I suppose, like Carol and others, that there's nothing I disagree with, and it's great to hear, hear it reinforced this afternoon. So I wanted to maybe even just bring um, the discussion into a very um, contemporary issue at the minute. I recognise you're all young women, um, and it's the whole discussion around um, the potential to make misogyny um, a crime. And if you have any wider thoughts then in terms of... Um, violence against women and girls and any of the issues then around um, safety for young women on the streets and just that general sense of feeling um, disempowered sometimes just because you were born female. Thank you. Don't start me on it, please. It is absolutely insane that this still happens. I don't think I know. I think something has most likely happened to every every young, young girl or young woman. Um, I every it's just something that's become so common and it's not brought enough to attention. It's taken the death of Sarah Everard to bring it to light, which is insane. It, if anybody else has anything else to say on it or else I'm just going to go off on a complete tangent. Yeah, no, Natasha, I completely agree with you. Like I've always said, like, having a death being the whole thing that it's been brought up, it's bringing to attention. It should have never came to that stage in the first place. But no, I grew up in a martial arts community, so I used to, I didn't really know. I was always taught self-defense. I didn't know when to use it. And it almost terrifies me that now being a teenager, I will have to use it. I just treated it like something fun as a sport. I don't, like, I haven't had a case of sexual harassment against me. I can say that. But hearing of what happens to all my friends when they go out, because I wouldn't go out that much, I, I just feel terrified. I get them to text me every 30 minutes when they're outside just to make sure they're still there. And then if they don't, I will call them. But no, I just, I desperately wish it wouldn't have came to a death for this to be brought to light. It's not even always just sexual harassment. It is even just getting approached in a, in a dodgy manner. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I think I agree with what you guys have both been saying. And I think it's just this normalization of the whole the whole situation, this normalization of catcalling and sexual harassment and this sort of culture of like rape jokes and everything. I think this is where it begins. And this is certainly very apparent, I think, among young people is that it's sort of belittled down to not, not be such a large issue as what it is. And like you said, it's shocking us that a, de a death of a woman has to has to raise this issue again, that we actually have to think about it and that it's not being raised, raised more. So, yeah. I think a big part of this Norman lot normalization of these uncalled for um, terms is because of the lack of education, especially around sexual health. Um, especially um, if, when I was taught sexual health, we were just taught the basic biologies of it without, you know, being, no, not just no, but like different ways you have to ask for consent and being not into it or, um, or even like saying um, like not unwanted um, attention is something like we're not taught about and it's, it should be something that it's something we should have a conversation on 
especially in schools, because the younger you learn these things, especially girls are taught um, to, you know, how to do that is, but boys need to be taught, or men need to be taught that, you know, what's wrong and what's right in these kind of situations. So that that is all uh, down to education at a young age, so that all everyone can feel safe out in the streets, in schools, in different environments. Gosh, you're all so eloquent, and thank you. I suppose we, we as a policy group yesterday in the Alliance Party were talking, you know, do people really think that we should have uh, it as a criminal offence, misogyny, and I suppose um, you have pretty much blown me away there that absolutely the generation coming through now are, are completely across this and, and very, very determined that we as policymakers and legislators actually follow through with that. So thank you, ladies, for that. I suppose just um, to also, you're not just young women, but some of you may potentially be carers or have other responsibilities. And I'm just wondering, is there anything else that you want to talk about in terms of how young people... Um, the responsibilities put on young people that you feel that a Bill of Rights may better protect you and be better supported in the law and young carers is one of them, but there's there's plenty of other areas. Please, thank you. Well, I wouldn't have anything personally, but my best friend, she's Polish and she would have or sometimes she would have to translate things in public to her parents. And the discrimination she will get for it. People don't even understand it's Polish she'll speak in. They'll call her a terrorist, even though speaking a language doesn't make you a terrorist whatsoever. But no, I feel like having the year in CRC, I, forget, I think, don't know what article it is precisely. It might be either 7 or 30, but it does let you um, have the right to a national identity, and she should have that, and um, she shouldn't be discriminated against for it, not even for speaking a language. I think the year in CRC will incorporate that perfectly and prevent, not prevent discrimination, but let them take it further and like defend it for herself even and on that note i'm half italian so i have seen firsthand the impact of brexit and the impact it's had on i'm lucky because i grew up with a uh, dual nationality but for example my dad and i know that he is not a young person <laughs> um but i have seen the impact of the the amount of effort is taken you know for in regards to Brexit, and also just on the note of UNCRC, as we've all said earlier, having it implemented into the Bill of Rights, into actual law, will ensure that it is always at the centre point of everything that affects young people. So I can't understand why you would not take the opportunity and give us that that peace of mind that is there and that is being protected for protecting us. No, thank you. I suppose the, the issue of, of, of newcomer families, and I suppose your your father and some of the people you've talked about aren't necessarily newcomers, but we have to think about people who are here and settled and, and those that are that are still yet to come. And the issue of minority language rights has come up. So again, you know, a, a lot of what you are saying today is reinforcing what we've heard, um, but, but it's great to hear. And thanks very much for your attendance today. Thanks, Paula. Carol, I think you've rejoined the call. Do you want to finish Dr. your remarks? Grant, can you hear me, Emma? Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, just to say thank you. Um, we're having these technical problems most of today, so I just want to thank you. Emma, can I just respond to Carol's point about Section 75? Um, oh. Yeah, we can hear yeah. you. Yeah, so you can hear me. That's okay. Sorry. It's just that on the group chat, um, when uh, uh, the member there talked about section, the, the, the young women were going, what section 75? Just want to remind the committee that schools um, are not subject to section 75. And section 75 is, is a really good start. And there, it's a really good point to make that it hasn't been properly implemented, but it is the start of something. And it full incorporation, as, as you've heard from the young woman, takes it to the next step and is all inclusive. So it's I suppose it's just to say absolutely that we, we need to get much, much better at the implementation of Section 75. But the, the incorporation of the UNCRC into the Bill of Rights will take it to the next step, which is which is what what really is being looked for here. And sure, that that Kula, that was my point because if anything, uh, I want to go for the ceiling rather than the floor. So that's that's a point I'm making. 
Okay, thank you. I have Mark indicating. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the panel. My camera never works, so it's not just an excuse that's specific today. And I'm ready to hit mute at any moment because I have two extremely young people in the room next door who are having a bit of a meltdown because their mother challenged their right to watch cartoons on her iPad that she needs for her work. Okay, so no, thank you for that. And it's, it's very refreshing and that's very important that we do listen to uh, the views of young people here. And, and, and like, like it's, it's great to hear from you, but it is more important that we actually do listen to you as well. I was going to touch on a, a wee point that Kira had raised. I think it was Kira anyway, and that was around the, the legacy of the conflict. And I think even... Hannah, or it might have been Natasha, touched on it as well in terms of the slowness of, of, of integration being maybe, well, it's actually more than a hangover uh, f from the, 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 the conflict. It's something that we see as an everyday r reminder and possibly effect of, of the conflict. But I was wondering, like, just in terms of particular challenges facing children and young people because of or related to the fact that you live in a post-conflict society, and I mean, one example would be would be the higher level of, of children suffering from poor mental health, and well, I suppose that's not exclusive to, to children, but but it certainly is something that would would spring to my mind. Yeah, no, um, having the integration skill or integrated skills is a huge step into recovering from the legacy of the conflict. Because as um, having different schools for different religions kind of already creates a separation between the two. And whereas people agree that um, faith should be taught in schools, it is something and that's important. But so is having, knowing how to, how a mortgage works, how tax works, but we're not taught there. That is something we learned at home. That's the argument. So we should, or, so faith should have really the same thing, that it could be taught at home. There are buildings for the spaces of worship to learn about your faith. A school shouldn't necessarily be that place. So yeah, I think um, one, there's no really real, real reason to have schools there as a segregation in between the two. No, uh, <laughs> thank you, Kieran. I'd certainly be inclined to, to agree with your your analysis there. I don't know had had anyone else say anything to add. Don't feel under pressure. Just just one more thing, and that's much reference had been made to the UNCRC, uh, which, but I was wondering, are there any particular rights or even articulations of particular rights within the UNCRC which you feel or, or, or would like to see replicated within our Bill of Rights? We're only taking all of them. It's all, it's all of them. That's your only option. Plus... That's no, that is your only option. You are putting all of the UNC or say, uh huh. Okay, no, that's fine by me. I, I, I can live with that, but I was just wondering, do you know, it is an order of preference or anything like that, but all, all, all required, all demanded, and hopefully all delivered. Yes, I think all of them, it's all or nothing, as we're saying. Like, no right should be put above another right is our key message here. And just going back to what we were saying about the conflict, sorry, just because I missed it there. But um, no I think real education, the problem is we're growing up in a post-conflict society. Is this sort of, like, it's, although although there is no conflict right now, it's it's still it's still there everywhere. I mean, people... If you don't go to integrate, integrate education, people aren't meeting a Catholic or a Protestant until they're well into adulthood. And it's this sort of lack of knowledge, as we're saying, with education and how, although maybe we may learn about other religions, we don't really learn about, about each other's religion, which is a big problem. And people sort of just hear rumours and they, they don't actually know what's fact. And it's really heavily influenced. So, yeah, it's just like what Kira was saying, that education is the real important factor here. And the UNCRLC are other also covers uh, communities that are still affected by um, conflict um, through violence. And yeah, I through that, having the NCC protecting them from them, they can go up not hindered by these um, past conflict issues and go into a developing if, and encouraging person. I feel like have um, the NCRC will just completely support all of it. 
Okay, super guys, thank you. Thanks, Chair. No problem, Mark. I don't see anyone else indicating. Chair, I just raised my hand. Sorry, Christopher. You no, no, okay. Sorry. Um, no, firstly, uh, I want to thank um, people that have come to speak to us uh, today. It's been very interesting um, to listen. Um, I absolutely agree with the points that have been made uh, around the provision of education in Northern Ireland. Were we designing an education system today, it would not look like that which we have today. There's no doubt about that. I also agree that we should be driving towards the development of a single education system for all of our children to be educated together, regardless of the religion of their parents. And I, I think that should be a, a guiding principle. However, in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, children have a right to be raised. This is in the document. People have a right to be raised by their parents in a particular cultural uh, grouping. So whether one is from a predominantly British culture or predominantly Irish culture, whatever, those rights are respected. So how do you think that the full implementation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the development of a shared single education system sit alongside each other and what can we as politicians be doing to deliver that? In, in my opinion, I believe it will just, it'll add a sense of inclusivity um, because then there'll be less, less of a taboo of, around it. Mm. A less of a, yeah, less of a taboo around um, a little bit more freedom or just a little bit of more allowance of uh, being allowed to express who you are or express your cult cultural identity or whatever openly and freely. I think in, in my constituency, I, I represent South Belfast, and South Belfast is a very diverse constituency. There are five assembly members from five different political parties, which reflects the diversity of opinion in the constituency. But my experience has been particularly at a primary school level I would say that the majority of primary schools in my constituency are integrated. Now, the sign above the door doesn't say an integrated primary school, but in terms of the children that are attending there, because the constituency is very, very diverse, the, the children are going to be very diverse. And I, mean, I mean, if you think of schools, for example, Rosetta Primary School, not Rita Primary School. I mean, in Fane Street Primary School, I think we have more than 70 languages spoken. So, and, and I think maybe we're a bit different in terms of the part of the world that I represent, but I would want to encourage you that I think even without the structural reform that is required, I think that society here is moving forward and we are becoming more integrated and traditional divides that existed are breaking down and I think that that can only be for the good of society as a whole. I think it definitely depends on the area though. I mean, whenever I went to my primary school, it was... It was slightly different to whenever I was, um, it's changed since then, but whenever I went there, it was very much Protestant. I personally, it was just the one close to my house. I am not biased in any way, but it was, yes, it was very much Protestant, depends on the area. Okay, that's great, thank you. Anybody else want to say anything else on that though? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I think what we're going to say is that although we're not trying to stop cultural identity, we're allowing people to express it. And so just because we're doing um, education doesn't mean to ignore each other. We're just trying to we're just trying to make more of an acceptance with one another. So we might say that uh, parents have the right to bring their child in the environment they want to of course have that right. But it's so that we can it's so we create more society overall. I think that's really what is anything they want. Okay. No other members have any questions and none of the panelists have any more comments. We can maybe leave it at that. I just want to reiterate my thanks to you all for coming to see us this afternoon and for your presentations and for giving such um accurate and honest and articulate accounts of the the 
priorities that you have and your experiences and just to say we really appreciate the time that you've um, brought to us so thank you very much um, and have a, a nice rest of your day to you all and we're going to let you drop off the call now thank you very much for, for taking the time thanks, thanks a lot. okay members i'm going to make a suggestion um before we go to the next item of of business that we um, send out thank you letters to the young people as we have done in the past so if everyone's in favor of that i can see nodding heads great chair good stuff right we're now um we're moving swiftly through business this afternoon so we've got our third and final presentation now um so item number four on our agenda is a briefing from mr niall murphy um his perspective on a bill of rights we're bringing Niall back into the spotlight here. So you can find, um, the clerk has prepared a memo, which you'll find at page 66 of your packs, but you also should have a written presentation from Niall that came in in table papers the other day. So Niall, thank you very much for your patience and for joining us this afternoon. I'll let you begin your presentation. Thank you. Um, very much obliged for the opportunity to make a submission to your committee. Uh, and thoroughly enjoyed uh, listening to the young people um, who, who went before, and it's important always to consider their perspectives. Um, whilst preparing for uh, this committee, uh, I was actually very encouraged and impressed uh, by the breadth and depth of impressive work and research uh, that is being undertaken. And I have to confess that I, I wasn't aware uh, as to the assiduous approach being adopted by your committee, so uh, I would like to commend you all um, f for the earnest work that is being undertaken in what is really a crucial and unresolved uh, area uh, for the advancement of everybody in this society. And what I hope to do today is to provide a practitioner's perspective. I appreciate that you have heard from um, people in the NGO sector, uh, from the judiciary, um, and from uh, the uh, Human Rights Commission itself. Um, but practitioners are also at the uh, forefront of uh, protecting and preserving and uh, divining uh, the, the rights-based society in which, in which we live. So just to introduce myself, I'm a partner in KRW Law. Uh, ours is a mixed legal practice whose portfolio includes criminal defence work, on public law with an emphasis on human rights, specifically in relation to uh, the legacy of our conflict um, through challenges to the decisions of public authorities and through civil litigation, which is in itself uh, a, a relatively uh, recent development in legal practice. We consider that our work in this regard, and it's replicated by many practitioners, uh, although motivated by private instructions, is overwhelmingly in the public interest uh, on behalf of a society uh, emerging from entrenched and generational conflict. And we all uh, are mature enough to recognise and appreciate that. We also conduct extensive engagements on behalf of our clients with the mechanisms currently constituting the package of measures as agreed by the British government with the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe following uh, the McCurr Group of Judgments uh, of the European Court of Human Rights. And those obviously include uh, the Office of the Police Ombudsman, the Legacy Investigation Branch of the PSNI, and our Legacy Inquest System, which is supervised by uh, our judiciary. There is a recognition or perception of our jurisdiction as being a state of exception, and that demands that access to justice be secured, and if that be through legal challenges to public authority decisions, uh, be they expressed via powers or policies or uh, civil litigation and private law claims, um, these should not be in the absence of human rights compliant mechanisms. Our office is regularly approached and instructed because litigation and the judgments and orders of the judiciary serve to fill the void in the absence of human rights compliant uh, mechanisms to investigate uh, the legacy of the conflict, uh, to deliver through the courts, through the judges, 
to deliver truth, justice and accountability. Uh, out with any particular narrative endorsement from a political constituency and out with a hierarchy of victims or a hierarchy of perpetrators. I should also say that I am the secretary of a civic organisation called Ireland's Future. Uh, Ireland's Future aspires to Irish reunification. Uh, Ireland's Future aims to facilitate and promote discussion towards that end in line with principles and processes set out in the Good Friday Agreement. Ireland's Future recognises and, and supports the need for widespread and inclusive debate involving all sections of civic, political and democratic opinion uh, on the form of any new future constitutional arrangements. Uh, it's in that context that I propose uh, to make my remarks. So really, the Good Friday Agreement itself, uh, w w which your committee uh, derives its authority from, albeit through a, through, through a long process. Human rights was embedded in it. Uh, one example of that, and it might be worth quoting, is a declaration of support at the start of the Good Friday Agreement. The tragedies of the past have left a deep and profoundly regrettable legacy of suffering. We must never forget those who have died or have been injured and their families. But we can best honour them through a fresh start in which we firmly dedicate ourselves to the achievement of reconciliation, tolerance, mutual <coughs> trust, and to the protection and vindication of the human rights of all. And I would like to say, from a professional perspective, it's a professional duty of the highest calling uh, to be instructed by people who, but for the circumstances of the most tragic moment in their lives, may never require the services of a solicitor uh, or to embark on courageous litigation that may define the law for the entirety, for everybody in our society. Very often when receiving instructions um, from a bereaved parent, child or sibling, you will not be surprised to hear that the refined complexities of law relating to liability or quantum are not issues which dominate that conversation. In the context of deaths which may have occurred in some circumstances over 40 years ago, the next of kin in the vast majority of instances will seek to pursue very simple yet compelling concepts, a fact-based account of what actually happened uh, to their loved one on the night they were murdered, and that the truth be rectified for the public record. Human rights were at the heart of the Good Friday Agreement, and I don't need to tell this committee that. The cursory search of the Good Friday Agreement shows that the word right or rights appears 61 times, as noted by the, U the then U UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Mary Robinson. She observed that the centrality of human rights was one of the key reasons um, of, the, of, of, the, of the Good Friday Agreement. Niall, sorry, someone isn't on yet. I think it might be Michelle. She's just popped up onto her screen there, so I just... If everyone just no puts something else on me, sorry, there's a wee bit of disturbance there. Sorry, thank you. No problem. Just, just to resume with, with Mary Robinson, she observed that equality and human rights have now moved in from the margins to the mainstream of Northern Irish life. So the commitment in the Good Friday Agreement to enshrining in Westminster legislation the Bill of Rights should be seen in that general context. It's not an incidental or optional extra. And we should remind ourselves of Martin Luther King Jr.'s observation that true peace is not merely the absence of tension, it's the presence of justice. And I would respectfully submit to your committee that surely our system of government and the administration of justice here must aspire to a higher calling than the mere silence of guns, as deafening and welcome as that silence is. The commitment to human rights is part of what brought us peace, the guarantee that everyone can feel that their rights will be respected and adhere to in the future. So whilst the formulation around the Bill of Rights in the Good Friday Agreement is complex, there is no doubt that this was the objective. It's confirmed in the subsequent St Andrews Agreement in 2006, which contained a commitment to progressing a Bill of Rights in the form of the Bill of Rights Forum, further demonstrating that rights are at the core of efforts uh, to advance our peace process. It's the last part of the Good Friday Agreement jigsaw 
and that ensures that, that rights currently enjoyed cannot be taken away at the whim of a government. It's intended to ensure that in a divided society, that whoever governs this narrow ground cannot rule without respecting the rights of everyone who lives here. It also ensures that those uh, who are not or do not identify primarily as part of the two main communities, and this is a growing constituency, that they will also have their rights respected. So I would like to touch upon what can a Bill of Rights do? Some very fundamental um, issues. A Bill of Rights effectively are a list of human rights that everyone is entitled to enjoy. They uphold rights and facilitate political accountability and good governance. And those are concepts which uh, we all aspire to. A Bill of Rights exists in many countries as a constitutional safeguard that underpin legislation and policy to ensure that rights are protected. The depth and scope, a scope of the process and the debate uh, that has taken place over many years is reflective of the importance and the constitutional nature of such a document. This should provide a timely reminder of the importance of giving permanent effect to the human rights and equalities promised in the Good Friday Agreement. And I would respectfully submit that that's a function which is best performed by a Bill of Rights. And I was encouraged uh, listening to the statistician that gave evidence in the first tranche uh, that there has been an overwhelming response. I think it was 82 uh, percent of, of respondents who are um, in support of a Bill of Rights. So I, I, I think it's safe to conclude that we will have a Bill of Rights uh, that will be enact, enacted, justiciable and enforceable. That will support good governance uh, by creating a rights informed structure of accountability. Um, and allowing uh, our legislature to be held to account. They can assist in ensuring that legislation, policy and practice do not deny fundamental rights uh, and will strengthen d democracy by underpinning it. Uh, it's been observed that a Bill of Rights that only lives in courtrooms is not a constitutional document worth having. The debate has been framed uh, through six simple words, uh, the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. Uh, it's clear that interpretations of that phrase vary and that there are many conflicting perspectives, all of which uh, require to be balanced and respected. Some of those engaging in the debate want to see the widest possible understanding of this phrase, whereas others understand it to be restrictive in meaning. Um, others take a stance somewhere in between. In its response to the advice of the Human Rights Commission in December 2008, the NIO in 2009 argued that most rights uh, proposed by the Commission uh, were already protected by existing legislation, policy or practice. And I would rhetorically ask, well, what's the problem then? What have we got to fear? Uh, and I would also ask the, the committee to be cognizant of the very live debate happening on the right wing fringes of the Conservative Party uh, seeking to repeal the Human Rights Act in 1998, of 1998 rather. Uh, that simple fact is a touchstone as to why we in this jurisdiction must have a Bill of Rights and it cannot be disregarded as a lunatic fringe because that's the same constituency that has visited Brexit upon all of us, an event that nobody here voted for and was overwhelmingly rejected by our electorate. So we do need to be vigilant as to future threats. And one of those threats is uh, this growing debate um, that the Human Rights Act itself be repealed. Um, Fintan O'Toole in the Irish Times has observed Northern Ireland is not Lincolnshire, or Somerset, it's a distinct, unique political entity recognised by an international treaty registered with the United Nations. It should also be, be re re reminded, we must recall, uh, that the Human Rights Commission's 2008 advice itself was a compromise document and did not include everything that a civil society uh, organisations had wanted. Um, the NIO's response, and I want to focus on this, uh, supported the inclusion of only two 
of the Human Rights Commission's 78 rec recommendations, uh, those two being the right to vote or be elected and the right to identify and be accepted as British or Irish or both. And what I would now like to do is examine how a Bill of Rights might have helped our jurisdiction in recent years. Uh, and I was struck in preparing for this by the submission of the Equality Coalition in their written evidence to, to your committee uh, and was very helpful and illustrative. A Bill of Rights, they argued, could have prevented many of the issues that destabilised power sharing and contributed to its collapse, i.e. legislation and policy uh, would not have been lawful with the Bill of Rights in place, would have stopped such uh, actions dead on its tracks. Um, that includes the diversion of executive business into repeated attempts to enact rights-based provisions would have already been in place uh, had a Bill of Rights been enacted. And with regards to my own professional and personal perspective, I would like to examine that uh, in, in three uh, areas, those being uh, legacy, uh, wherein I have a professional practice, uh, citizenship, um, which is touched upon through Ireland's future, and from a personal perspective, uh, with regard to the language protection, I raise my children um, through the medium of Irish and they attend Irish medium uh, primary schools. Uh, with regards to, to legacy, the legacy provisions of a Bill of Rights would have ensured the codified incorporation um, of Article 2 requirements to independent investigations into unsolved, unresolved deaths and thus would have prevented the antics of the Secretary of State last year when he abandoned the Stormont House Agreement uh, for some theoretical non-investigative information gathering exercise. Uh, I, I, I was unfortunately in a, in a coma when that happened um, due to complications arising from COVID and I, I couldn't believe it when, when I came around uh, that the that the Secretary of State would, would seek to unravel uh, a locally agreed uh, political agreement. The High Court is already exercising uh, safe custodianship of the principles of Article 2, and I have included as an annex uh, to my written submissions a list of judgments upholding the principles by our local High Court. However, victims and survivors should not be required to assert their rights through active litigation in this day and age, and sometimes it's lost on politicians just how emotionally devastating it is uh, for victims and survivors to be engaged in entrenched litigation. I know uh, after consultations and long hard days in the High Court that many families go home and cry themselves to sleep and that should not be a recourse uh, that victims and survivors should be put through. Compliance with Article 2 of the European Convention is not merely an issue for Stormont because Stormont is not a sovereign entity. Westminster is, and it's Westminster that signed the European Convention on Human Rights. Similarly, it is for Westminster legislate, to legislate on this Bill of Rights as previously promised. With regards to citizenship, had even one of the two recommendations which the NAO accepted from the Human Rights Commission's 78 recommendations been adopted in the Bill of Rights, in one subtle and decisive piece of legislative drafting, we could have totally nullified and neutered the most vexed constitutional question posed this century, Brexit. Had the, the, the citizenship provisions been in place, it would have most notably precluded the imposition of a hard border uh, on our island. The mere adoption of the right to identify and be accepted as British or Irish would have foreseen with Solomon-like wisdom, the Home Office's hostile environment decision to treat almost all persons born here as British for statutory purposes. Uh, that decision, well known due to the challenge by Anna D'Souza, was expressly taken to prevent Irish citizens born in the North from exercising EU rights tied to Irish citizenship. This led to the extraordinary position of the UK Home Office suggesting that people renounce British citizenship, that many of hundreds of thousands never considered that they held, should they wish to exercise their rights in question. These problems could not have arisen had the Bill of Rights citizenship provisions been 
enforce. On language, the fact that this jurisdiction is the only region in Britain or Ireland that makes no statutory provision for the protection of a minority language in accordance with the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages, which was signed and ratified over 15 years ago, is remarkable. Irish is an official language in the Republic of Ireland, uh, guaranteed constitutional status through Bunrock and Heron, with Welsh uh, being afforded statutory protection under the Welsh Language Act 1993, which has had several re statutory renewals since. Scots Gaelic is protected under Agna Gaelic, Alba, 2005. So why is it that citizens in Scotland, Wales and in the South all benefit from statutory protection for Indigenous languages, but that's a right that's denied to citizens here? And I look forward to that legislation being um, progressed uh, before the Assembly elections next year. But this issue, which contributed to concerns over the sustainability of the institutions, could have easily been neutralised by a Bill of Rights. It shouldn't have taken this long. Whereas many language rights campa campaigners have commented that the Human Rights Commission's advice in 2008 could have gone further in terms of protections, the advice did recommend that the provisions of the European Charter on Regional Minority Languages should be justiciable, which would have cauterised unlawful intentions at an early stage. In recent years, I have been instructed by clients who have successfully challenged the unlawful cancellation of the LIFA bursary scheme in December 2016, and also the unlawful language policy adopted by Antrim and Newton Abbey Borough Council in 2018, which sought to adopt a policy imposing a blanket ban on bilingual street signs containing displays in both Irish and English. And whereas I, of course, enjoy receiving instructions, taking and winning cases in court and being paid, Citizens should not be compelled to seek recourse to the High Court to safeguard their rights when a Bill of Rights should set this out in stone. I want to discuss how a Bill of Rights might be considered an insurance policy for all citizens going forward. In deeply divided societies, it has been observed um, that law is not always viewed as politically neutral or objective. One commentator has noted that unionist ideas about what a Bill of Rights should encompass are deeply informed by perceptions of the legitimacy of the state and its, uh, its institutions. The DUP, in their 2003 document, A Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland, assert caution on the imposition by a Bill of Rights of constraints and limitations on the executive, giving judges a more expansive role. Although, I would argue, surely that judicial supervision with the benefit of 18 years has been expansive anyway in the absence of a Bill of Rights. Uh, Louise Mollander, the academic at Queen's University, argues that unionist self-identification with the state means that actions are perceived as anti-British or anti-the British state are also perceived as anti-unionist. She has uh, reported a quote by the current First Minister, Arlene Foster, who stated that human rights is like a foreign language to most, uh, referring to unionists. Uh, that was um, in, in, in an article in the Fortnite magazine in February 2003. A former PUP representative uh, was also reported as saying, rights are seen as a Catholic thing. It's not a Protestant thing. Uh, my citation for that is political capacity building, advancing a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland, Chapter 2, in a book published in 2014. And I would hope and trust that if that innate sensibility is actually accurate, I would respectfully submit that it is misplaced. Rights are not British or Irish. Rights are for everyone. They are blind to nationality. Everybody benefits with a strong uh, framework for protection and everyone loses when rights are deprived. The risk is that the value to be derived for all communities through active engagement with rights discourse is therefore lost. I return to the Commission's advice in 2008, which was itself faithful to the explicit part of esteem provision within the Good Friday Agreement, whereby it provided for a right that public authorities must fully respect on the basis of equality of treatment, the identity and ethos of both main communities in Northern Ireland, and added the important qualification 
that no one is relying on this provision may do so in a manner inconsistent with the rights and freedoms of others. In short, this equality of treatment provision protects both main communities. Indeed, in, the, in this week, the week of the census, unionism and loyalism may reflect on changing demographic tides and the fact that unionism has lost its majority, a majority held and inbuilt since the inception of this state in the three parliaments to which it aspires in the last three elections, a majority which has gone forever. Gregory Campbell spoke on Monday night on RTE of three minority communities in the North, and that could be right. It might bear the interests of unionism well to consider a Bill of Rights as a necessary insurance policy in the face of future constitutional change. And of course, this is the genius of the Good Friday Agreement, which guarantees mutual equivalence. The Good Friday Agreement requires that the power of the sovereign government with jurisdiction there shall be exercised with rigorous impartiality on behalf of all of the people in the diversity of their identities and traditions and shall be founded on the principles of full respect for and equality of civil, civil political, social and cultural rights of freedom from discrimination for all citizens and of piety of esteem and of just and equal treatment for identity, ethos and aspiration of both communities. That phrase should be written as a tablet in stone somewhere, that everybody will have equal protection under the law. The obligation of rigorous impartiality will transfer to the Irish government in the event of reunification. The commitments to parity of esteem, equality of treatment and rights will have implications for reunification proposals. The Irish government is under an obligation to provide at least an equivalent level of rights protection and has already made changes to its own constitution to reflect that aspect of the agreement. It's notable, for example, that the agreement anticipated a Bill of Rights uh, for Northern Ireland and led to further effect being given to the European Convention of Human Rights and the creation of the Human Rights Commission. Any Bill of Rights adopted now will have implications and guarantees required in the event of reunification. Work will be needed to ensure that there is um, minimum equivalence and that reunification results in no diminution of protections. As noted, this will create an opportunity to discuss the adoption of perhaps even more expansive range of rights and equality guarantees. And now is the time to do that. Professor Monica McWilliams, uh, the, the commissioner who uh, proposed the 2008 advice, stated in, in the preamble to that advice, a democratic society must respect the human rights of all if it is to be worthy of that name and should provide assurances that people are to be treated fairly. By affording protections and safeguarding against abuses, a Bill of Rights should move us forward from our contentious past, as well as being a point of reference for future generations. No one should feel defensive by the enactment of these rights. A Bill of Rights must be applicable to everyone and should, in this sense, belong to all of us. So in conclusion, I think, I think I, 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 I have made presentations on, on this general area before, and I often return uh, to, to, to the theme I'm going to close on. But that's because it really does bear relevance to, to our current considerations. And this is it. It should be recalled that the European Convention on Human Rights was drafted by British lawyers, some of whom prosecuted at the Nuremberg trials, determined to spur Europe from the horrors of communism and fascism. Indeed, one of the draftsmen of the convention was David Maxwell Fife, um, his family of Fife Bananas, in fact. And he was a, a very senior conservative politician and at one stage was Home Secretary. When he worked on the European Convention of Human Rights in the late 1940s, he and other European conservatives disposed of early drafts that mentioned the rights of workers. The European Convention of Human Rights makes no mention of shelter, housing, free education or health care. The European Convention on Human Rights is not a radical left-wing liberal document. Indeed, Maxwell Fife himself was a stern advocate for the criminalisation of homosexuality. 
whilst Home Secretary in 1952, he issued the Maxwell Fife Directive, which became the de facto constitution of the Security Service uh, bef until the Security Service Act 1989 set it on a statutory basis. So Mr. Maxwell Fife was a very safe, conservative pair of hands, and he drafted the European Convention on Human Rights. In a celebrated speech in 2009, the late Lord Bingham listed the liberties which the European Convention protects. And these are basic principles. The right to life, the right not to be tortured or enslaved, the right to liberty and security of the person, the right to marry, the right to a fair trial, the freedom of thought, conscious and religion, the freedom of expression, the freedom of assembly and association. And Lord Bingham uh, rhetorically inquired of his audience, which of these rights, I ask, would we wish to discard? Are any of them trivial, superfluous, unnecessary? Are any of them un-British? There must be no retreat from human rights and equality gains. Rather, they must be woven into the legal fabric of our society in a Bill of Rights which will benefit everyone in the future, irrespective of the prevailing constitutional status. Thank you. Niall, thank you very much for that. Um, that combined with your written presentation was uh, indeed very detailed. And um, I suppose I want to ask you a question that focuses on the, one of the last comments that you made or one of the, the areas that you touched on lastly. I know you're um, involved in the Ireland's Future Initiative and it'll not be any surprise that my position in the constitutional situation aligns with your own. And I've asked other presenters to this committee around a Bill of Rights as an accountability mechanism and as something to hold governments to account to prioritise rights and to ensure that decisions that they are making are not going to not only negatively impact on citizens, but done with the best interest of, of citizens at heart. But I noticed you've referred there to a Bill of Rights as a necessary insurance policy in the face of future constitutional change for the unionist population in the North and presumably in the South as well. And I wondered if, because obviously as the conversation is happening at the minute and the likelihood of constitutional change increases all the time and we can see how negative Brexit was and you've referred yourself to sort of the, the toxic debate and the, the toxic impacts of Brexit and, and how that was mishandled by you know the, the right-wing architects within the Tory government in, in England. How a rights-based approach could have a different it could mean something different for constitutional change in the island of Ireland and how that could ensure that if we had a, a Bill of Rights or a Charter of Rights North and South, that that could change how, how it would impact on all our citizens as we move into reunification. Well, the, the, the opportunity uh, which is being examined by, by your committee is um, the, it's the most timious uh, opportunity perhaps uh, the century <clears throat> to really enshrine and place on a constitutional footing and to shape the landscape for human rights for this century, um, irrespective of constitutional status. Uh, we, we don't know what Westminster is going to do next, um, but we do have the opportunity to shape the human rights landscape for this jurisdiction now. And in doing so, because of the um, mutual equivalence uh, provisions of, of the Good Friday Agreement, we therefore get to shape um, and dictate uh, the human rights landscape uh, for any new constitutional arrangement that may come to pass. Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't doubt uh, that there is a lot of water uh, to go under the bridge before that may occur. But the opportunity to shape, refine and define the landscape for us now and for us all in the future really is a legislative gift, an opportunity uh, that, that, that your committee actually has a very historic weight upon its shoulders uh, and the key is timing and now is the time. Uh, the Good Friday Agreement was, is 23 years old uh, I find it remarkable that 23 years on, uh, this key provision 
um, that was overwhelmingly overwhelmingly mandated uh, by the people has not been um, legislated for. Um, so if not now, when? And if not by this committee, by whom? You know, th this is the opportunity uh, to shape and define a rights matrix uh, f forever, because whatever is agreed will have to be, uh, as an irreducible minimum, replicated uh, in the event of constitutional change. Thanks, Niall. Um, I just have one more question, and you've set this out very clearly in your in your presentations, both oral and written. Um, so I don't want to rehash over old ground too much, but just to to draw some of it out. And I know even in the comments that you'd referred to around sort of the perception of unionist opposition to a bill of rights or to legislating for rights. And we can see that even in the survey that this committee carried out there that we had results off earlier in our meeting this afternoon, that there, there was widespread support for a bill of rights and the, the, the high proportion of unionists or people from a PUL background uh, responding to the survey were in support of, of legislating for a bill of rights. So I think sometimes that has been a misconception and ha has been um, perpetuated unnecessarily. But just in terms of the comments that you made around the Irish language and the fact that the North is the only jurisdiction without that protection for minority languages or indigenous um, languages, I, I know that much has been made and the, the CAJ Equality Coalition briefing around things that would have been prevented uh, by a Bill of Rights. And we can see even this week talk around blocking an Irish Language Act or the lack of progress on that. We didn't have an assembly for a number of years and denial of rights was the reason for that. We probably could be in, in a situation where certain things wouldn't have happened or where blockages wouldn't have arisen had these rights been in place. Would would you agree with that? Yes, and it, it would have perhaps made uh, I, I I don't I don't uh, envy your role as elective elected representatives. You 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 all collectively uh, carry a very significant weight on behalf of all all of society and often I think there's too much criticism and it's easy uh, to lament and, 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 and criticise politicians when, when I know that nobody enters public life um, other than to do their best by their constituents. Um, but a Bill of Rights would have made the role of ele elected representatives perhaps much easier because the matter would have been uh, neutralised taken out of uh, the hands um, had had the Bill of Rights been legislated for when it should have been legislated for. And really, the failure uh, to give legislative expression to that which was democratically mandated overwhelmingly by the electorate here uh, lies squarely with the British government, I, re I regret to observe, um, and it, it, it now is incumbent uh, up, upon the executive um, to ensure that those legislative failings of the past are not allowed to perpetuate any further. And really, it, it will make your lives easier because um, the, the, the Bill of Rights will stand up for itself. And as I say, it's not, there's not British rights, there's not Irish rights, they are human rights. The, the key is in the title. We are all humans, therefore, uh, when rights are protected, everybody benefits. And I, I just find it a, a curiosity that anybody would seek to, uh, in this day and age in the 21st century, limit um, the, the rights which any person in this society uh, should enjoy. And really, the, 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 the time for talking is drawing to a close, and the time to legislate uh, should, should really be beginning to begin. 
Thanks, Niall, um, and I'm in total agreement. Um, I'm going to pass now to the Vice Chair, Mike. Do you have any questions or comments? I have some of both, Chair. Niall, good to see you. Thank you for engaging. Thank you, Mike. Um, you know, given you made reference to, to, to the coma, I just want to say I hope you are now fully recovered from yeah. COVID-19. You're, you're looking good. Um, by, by way of comment, I was, I was pleased you mentioned the declaration of support at the beginning of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. I, mean, I understand it is a complex, interwoven, interdependent document, but I would quote that particular paragraph a lot because I do think that, that relationships are, are as key today as they were 23 years ago. And I would also suggest every time an issue here at Stormont has escalated into a crisis, Part of the problem is the, the right relationships weren't there uh, to, to, to deal with it. Just also, Niall, I mean, I, I know what you were saying, but I think at one point you said nobody here voted for Brexit. I mean, just to be clear, obviously, 44% uh, 44 did. Uh, yes, sir. I was not one of them. Two questions. Um, you, you talk about the minority languages within the European Union, but not the framework convention uh, on national minorities. I just wonder if that is something you would agree we need to be looking at as we go into our deliberation phase. And, and the second one is you, you make reference, which is in the agreement, to the fact if we do something in this jurisdiction uh, on, on rights, that the, that places an obligation on the government of Ireland to do the same in their jurisdiction. Now, this is something, and, and keep me right here, Chair, but I think um, Judge Richard Humphreys got, got quite nervous when we discussed that, when he was giving his evidence. And, and I got, kind of got the impression he was saying, well, that was 23 years ago. And you really can't have one jurisdiction imposing legislative statutory duties on another. So just share your thoughts on, on those two areas now, please. Thank, thanks, mate. Uh, just take the second one first. Um, and I can say this because I'm not likely to appear in front of Judge Humphreys not being called in the South, uh, whether he's nervous or not. Um, I would respectfully argue that um, it's, it's, it's black and white. It's clear. And I actually I would implore everybody to read. Judge Humphreys actually wrote an exceptional book on the Good Friday Agreement, so he's quite an authoritative um, person. Uh, and I'm surprised to... To, to hear of his reticence as to the mutual equivalence um, guarantees, because my my reading of of it is that it is um, very very clear, very succinct, that if there is a rights guarantee uh, which is afforded uh, in this jurisdiction, that in the event of constitutional change, that must be replicated going forward. Um, France is on its fifth republic, uh, if my history A level serves me right. Um, the, the, in the event of constitutional change, and I, I know that today is not the forum for that, but if there was, uh, I would expect that the new island nation would require its own new constitution, and in effect it would be uh, a second republic. Uh, that must in and of itself um, understand and appreciate the concerns of every single citizen and every single section of society uh, in that document. Um, so I, 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 I would be quite uh, bombastic that there would be a constitutional guarantee of mutual equivalence of rights uh, going forward. And the opportunity to shape that lies in your hands. And I, I return to the unenviable weight that, that falls on, on, on your collective shoulders, and, and I have full respect for all of you for that. Uh, the, 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 the first inquiry, very simple. I, I, I was, you know, th there are over 20 rights that, that I could have sharpened in and, and focused on, and I appreciated uh, the short window of opportunity um, in this, and absolutely. Uh, the, 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 the framework to which you refer um, should, should form part of your considerations. I, 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 philosophically, I would adopt a, an expansive approach rather than a restrictive approach. 
Okay, appreciate that. Uh, just on, on the second point, I'm, I'm now nervous that I'm either misquoting or mis, mis, misunderstanding Richard Humphreys, but in terms of what you're saying, are you saying these sort of equivalents would, would only come in the event of constitutional change? Because I thought the, the agreement said as soon as we did it, the obligation would be on the government of Ireland to react basically in a timely manner. It would, it would absolutely be required in the event of constitutional change. Uh, I, I would be 100% certain of that. Would a Bill of Rights, um, as adopted in, the, in this jurisdiction, be immediately transposable uh, to the southern jurisdiction? I'm, I'm not sure that, that the Good Friday Agreement, I, would, I wouldn't want to publicly profess that. Uh, without researching it further, and will undertake to do so. Um, but I, I would expect that it should. Um, but it, certainly, in the event of constitutional change, I would be certain that it must. Okay, I, I would appreciate your view on on the the issue because uh, I think there is certainly some confusion in here. Now, good to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got Carol, then Mark, then Paula. So, Carol. You want to go ahead? Hi, Niall. So, just to echo, it's nice to see you. Um, Emma, can you hear me? Because I'm having problems with my computer. You are, Grant. Niall, just as I said to the other um, witnesses, I, I, I've had my camera off because I'm having problems with my uh, tablet. So, it's not to say I'm not interested and I'm skiving off here and looking very carefully. And like Mike said, I'm delighted to see you and really good health. Um, so just to put that on the record. Thank you. Um, I, I, I think the book's Beyond the Borders, Richard Harris book. And um, I think Mary McAleese wrote the forward for it. And it's it's a good read. I, I wasn't on the committee uh, when um, Judge Harris came and, and presented, so be keen. Um, but even just reading that book and some of the questions and even just some of the events, it struck me that because Ireland was is a co-guarantor of the Good Friday Agreement, that there needs to be, um, in the event of any uh, unity referendum or transfer, that there needs to be almost a, a second charter for a second republic and all those rights. And the fact that you've got ACHR as a... a as you would say, or maybe you, you, no, you didn't say, but I say it almost as a floor. Then you you start to build in your stars and you're sailing after that. So that would be my expectation. But I am not legally trained. I'm just an avid reader and think, try to think my way through all this. But now look, the the kind of questions and observations I have, and first of all, thank you for your lengthy presentation and your written presentation. Uh, very concise and very thought-provoking. But within that, um, and I want, also want to declare an interest as the person responsible for bringing LIFA. I'm not getting into the whole LIFA debacle, but what one of the things I do want to say is that, uh, you know, when things are fragile here politically, the first place people go for is you're not getting an Irish Language Act. And... I think, you know, in absence of the Bill of Rights, that leaves many children and young people and families feeling very fragile and very nervous, despite the fact that it was in a new decade, new approach. So I just want to put that in the record. But given you said that there is a review uh, of the Human Rights Act uh, by Westminster, and you've also said that Westminster should bring forward a Bill of Rights, um, then in the event that, for example, that the won't, then what options do people have? Uh, and I appreciate it's a small minority who want to review the Human Rights Act, but still small minorities have an, they're like we acorns, they have an ability to grow at a very fast pace. So there's that. And then the other question really was um, in relation to the, I suppose the, the Court of Human Rights have ruled on um, loads of cases, Article 2 cases, uh, and to, you know, the fact that the, the Article 2 has been breached 
um, and you know families have had to use solicitors like yourselves to try and find out what happened to their loved ones. So recently, the Council of Europe have decided to step in and open up an investigation into murder of and indeed they'll probably will do that in others. In your opinion, if these rights were properly incorporated into a Bill of Rights, can we uh, can we be sure that they're going to be applied retrospectively? And indeed, um, what would your view be on if we had a Bill of Rights with people still need to go to the court in the way that they have um, in order to get access to um, a hearing. And then the last thing um, I'll say is that you you heard the presentation um, from the survey into a Bill of Rights and while Louise and Richard have been given a lot of uh, kudos to that, you've got Carly and Marty off here who are heavily involved in that. But it is including, even from 2003 and 2008, that you've got 82% of citizens here who want a Bill of Rights. In the event that there is a clear majority for a Bill of Rights and a Bill of Rights won't be achieved, in your opinion, where do people go next? Thanks, now, Gormogat. Thank you. Um... If, if I might take the second question first, uh, please, Carl, the issue as to re the retrospective application of Article 2 ex post um, its inception in a Bill of Rights. Uh, I, 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 I could confidently proffer uh, a guarantee that it would be retrospective, independent of Westminster's uh, legislative position on um, a repeal of, of the of the Human Rights Act 1998 because, um, or or indeed, uh, if if Britain was to um, derogate from uh, the Council of Europe and withdraw from uh, the provisions of of the Convention, which David Maxwell Fife and others drafted, which would be remarkable, you know. If you think of the macro, international, global, political, political message that would send to a Russia or a Saudi Arabia or a Turkey, you know that that Britain is is doesn't consider itself bound by the European Convention of Human Rights. It, it would be a catastrophic uh, political message uh, for Britain to send. I, I I think the sensible people in in that room would prevail, uh, but there are. There are those who aren't sensible that 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 are are seeking to uh, to do that. Uh, Theresa May, and I don't think her political position uh, was adequately weighed up historically. And history might do this in future years. As Home Secretary, she was against Brexit, but was pro the repeal of the Human Rights Act, and. That was a much more dangerous position. Her her view of the Human Rights Act and, and the provisions of the Convention were that it uh, frustrated her um, her her role as 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 Home Secretary, and she understood the economic madness uh, that Brexit was. Um, but in in, the, in terms of the selfish, uh, arrogant. British interests that it would not be told to, what to do by Europe. Um, she understood that, you know, whether a banana was straight or, or bent was neither here nor there. Uh, but if it was impeding her uh, uh, execution of her power as Home Secretary, well then that that was the problem, uh, and that was a that, that was an opinion that did not hold sway in the cabinet at that time. Uh, but it seems to be one uh, which, which is coming back. Um, now, it can't unravel the Good Friday Agreement because the Good Friday Agreement uh, legislates uh, the Convention into our domestic law and, you know, almost constitutionally, it's something that citizens here will always benefit from. But as your analogy goes, it's a ceiling, it's a floor, not a ceiling. And it's the really the, the basic premise from which we should seek to aspire. And I, 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 
I renew my observations in relation to uh, the, the, the convention itself that it wasn't, isn't um, a liberal left wing document. Uh, citizens in Dublin who, who can't get a house at the minute, I'm sure, uh, lament the fact that uh, the right to housing wasn't protected in the European Convention of Human Rights because um, the debacle on housing in the South might not be where it is uh, had it been. So, yes. Um, there would be retrospective application of Article 2 uh, in a Bill of Rights, uh, as a matter of fact, absolutely. Um, with regards to the inquiry, might citizens still seek the recourse of the court? Th they might very well so. Uh, indeed, the only reason, for example, the only reason that the police ombudsman has a historic directorate, and this is often lost, in discourse around uh, legacy investigations, uh, Chris Patton did not envisage the police ombudsman to have a historic directorate. Its retrospective mandate was 12 months. It was the British government that proposed that the ombudsman have a historic remit to investigate uh, Article 2 offences, for which it was liable, for which the British government was liable because it was a signatory of the European Convention of Human Rights for so long, and because it had been found guilty in Strasbourg over six cases from 2000 to 2004, they're called the McCurr group of cases, of which Fanukin was one, Shanahan another. Uh, the, the cumulative effect of those six uh, Strasbourg cases was such that Britain was condemned as a human rights abuser with regards to the most fundamental right, Article 2, the right to life. So Britain was obliged to uh, execute those judgments. And there is an office in Strasbourg uh, called the, the uh, Supervision of the Execution of Judgments Office that ensure that there is compliance. And it is that office which uh, prepares a report for the Committee of Ministers to ensure that, that governments are complying with their duties under uh, the Convention and in, in, in compliance with uh, court orders. Um, so the only reason that there is an ombudsman, uh, a historic director to the ombudsman, is because Britain proposed it to Strasbourg when it, had, when it was found guilty by the court. What are you going to do about this? Well, we're going to put a historic director onto this new fancy office that we've got. Uh, simply um, legacy legacy inquest as well. Legacy, the, our, 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 our colonial system is not does not have the capacity to, uh, or did not rather have the capacity uh, to deal with uh, the many legacy inquests that it has. Uh, but through 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 the courageous pioneering work of of our, our Lord Chief Justice, uh, who retires this summer and ha will leave big boots that will be need to be filled, um, the court stood up and said, "We will dis." Regards the state's obligation under Article 2 because he's a judge, he understands the law. Um, but where these mechanisms fall down is resource. And, you know, I, I, I did a Zoom recently with the Justice Minister and reinforced to her that, for example, with the Ombudsman's Office, and it was with the Umber Road families after the disgraceful events of the 5th of February. Um, there's no point having an ombudsman's office that doesn't conclude reports in a timely fashion. And the ombudsman's budget for the historic director has been shrinking really since uh, since Al Hutchinson's time. Uh, the budget this year is less than what it was 10 years ago, but it has many more hundred cases that it must investigate. And it is... It's mostly very difficult as a solicitor to sit down with perhaps a widow in her 80s or a mother in her 80s and take her through a letter just received from the Ombudsman that says, we will not start your investigation until 2025 because we have no money. And that lady knowing she's not going to see 2025 or 2028 when she might receive a report. And similarly with the inquest system, uh, where you know it has been observed that we could be doing inquests for the next 30 years unless resources applied and the direction and application 
question of resource is a political decision. And if we, if you rather, as the executive and legislators, apply the appropriate resource to institutions which the government has proposed to discharge its sovereign obligations, well, then all of society will benefit. And, you know, policing, for example, will benefit when it doesn't have to deal with legacy. Um, our, our, our legal system will benefit uh, when, when families are not having to uh, challenge decisions in the high court. The judiciary will benefit because, you know, even with COVID, uh, there is a long backlog which is uh, fast emerging. So to, to, to cut a long story short, and I apologise for, for the length that I've, I've gone on, uh, the families may well find themselves back in court uh, litigating to ensure that their rights are protected and that that might be a resource issue and that that is a, that is a political responsibility. Thank you, Nan. Carol to Michael Laurie, yeah. Um, I know the clerk has indicated that Mark has his hand up and Paula, I can see you with your hand up. So we'll go to Mark first and then Paula. Cheers, uh, Chair. Thank you, Niall, for the presentation. It's great to see you, uh, see you looking so well and hear you sounding uh, so well and obviously recovering well as well. That, that, that's great. I had been going to ask a question and then I decided it was a stupid question, so I wasn't going to ask one then, but then just the, the last remarks then that Niall made have led nicely on to another one and made me think of another one. And I know earlier, Niall, you referred to the Bill of Rights, I think you used the term, an insurance policy. I remember in the earlier evidence sessions, and I can't remember who exactly, but but definitely I think there was a member of the judiciary and, and, and someone else from the legal profession who had expressed a, a degree of nervousness around the, the number and maybe nature of claims on this insurance policy. Uh, you referred there yourself to the, the backlog of cases in the, in, in the court now particularly exacerbated uh, by, by the, the, the COVID situation. W would you have a view on that? Do you think once we got, or once we get, sorry, a Bill of Rights, that there'll be a kind of deluge or, 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 or rush of cases at the outset and that'll taper off initially? Or No, no, because fundamentally the core rights, which a Bill of Rights will protect, uh, are already justiciable. I don't foresee, uh, at, at, in policy terms and law, it's called the floodgates argument. I don't see the event of a Bill of Rights creating uh, a floodgates uh, concern for for the courts. Uh, that dam already burst yeah. in, in the year 2000 when uh, the Human Rights Act, which was uh, legislated for in 1988, but wasn't incorporated until 2000 are given legislative effect, uh, which then allowed citizens to domestically uh, litigate their expectations of the convention uh, in, in, in local courts. So, you know, there, there are not going to be uh, a, a floodgate opening of, uh, of future litigation. Uh, I, I, I much prefer to consider the Bill of Rights to be uh, a protection for our future generations uh -huh. and wh whereas we our generation will shape and define it as Maxwell Fife's did the European Convention it will be future generations of young citizens and, and we, we heard their evidence um, just before three o'clock uh, so cogently and eloquently uh, it's, it, it, it is it is our future generations that we are uh, legislating to protect. Okay, no, super now. Just good to get your perspective on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Go to Paula. Um, thank you, Chair. And um, thank you, um, Niall, for your presentation today. Uh, I think it was um, probably a wee bit further, went a wee bit further maybe than what I was expecting from your opening line, and that was that you were coming here to present as somebody who works 
in the field and, and will you know be dealing with this in the courts and I was just wondering if you could talk more to how you think this would impact on your work um, as a solicitor um, uh, as somebody in the legal profession going forward thank you well a, a, a bill of rights will provide a, a very d definitive um, local uh, framework uh, that will, will assist people in asserting uh, their constitutional privileges. Um, I, I, I would actually foresee a Bill of Rights as having a, a, a preemptive medicinal um, effect in so far as it will cauterize um, wrongful intentions in local authorities be they councils or statutory bodies, um, because anything that they would seek to attempt, they must uh, watermark that or benchmark it against the Bill of Rights. Um, so, f for example, uh, the, the the council decision um, that I uh, re referred to could not have got off the ground. Um, had had they had there been a bill of rights that their legal advisors would have had to have consideration of, um, and in effect, therefore, that makes for good governance. And really, that's that, that's one of the overarching principles of a bill of rights that it 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 makes um, it makes the role of the legislator less contentious because there is a sterile tablet. That, that that has um, right written down on it that will assist uh, and prevent either by misguided or malevolent intention uh, wrongful intentions being taken forward so in fact going back to Mark's inquiry might this lead to uh, a, a, a floodgate of litigation it, it actually could lead to less um, because there would be a stronger base framework from which all uh, legislative or executive intentions would have to comply. Um, thank you. And I suppose what we, we, we've been using the term on the um, committee here as a sort of pre-legislative scrutiny tool. So as you say, that so that the policies and the laws don't actually get that far that they could um, breach human rights. So no, no, I appreciate your answer on that. Um, I suppose my second question then is around the changing um, demography um, in Northern Ireland, not just around the growth of the centre ground, who maybe don't identify um, as Unionist or Nationalist, or maybe identify as Irish and British at the same time. And I'm just wondering how you would feel that a Bill of Rights could actually contribute to a more cohesive society here where um, more people feel a sense of um, place and that this is a place where they feel valued and belong. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, I, I made that reference in my remarks that uh, rights are not British or Irish rights are for everyone. They're human rights uh, and everybody benefits when everybody benefits. Um, so that that immediate uh, concrete base, um, to use Carl's analogy, uh, will create a stronger uh, footing for all of us uh, to enjoy our, our citizenship. And I do agree with um, Gregory Campbell's r remarks on RT and Monday night, wherein he referenced the, the fact that there are there will likely ex post census be three minorities uh, in our jurisdiction, and therefore we have to we are codependent on each other. We all live here. We're all each other's neighbours. We all work together, go to school together, socialise together, um, and our codependence on our vigilance for each other and, and, and everybody's respective rights will make uh, for a better society in my, in my respective opinion. Um, I, 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 I just think that uh, nobody should feel threatened when uh, another person in society feels protected. Okay, thank you, Niall. And I'd just like to echo what others have said. It's good to see you in good health and at committee today. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, Paula, thank you. I don't think any other members are indicating. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Uh, I think we can uh, leave it there then, Nell. And look, I just want to reiterate um, our thanks to you for joining us this afternoon and for your presentation and for your lengthy um, question and answer sessions. And again, the best wishes of everyone and, and your your ill health last year and great to see you out and about and, and luck as well. So thank you very much. We'll let you drop off the call now. Thank you. Thank you, Niall. Thank and you. by the way, it's beyond the borders. And it's very good. Available for rent. Who's going to lend you my copy, Mike? Who's going to lend you my copy, Mike? You've got to have it. Okay, everyone. As uh, Niall drops off the call, we can now go on to the next item on our uh, agenda this afternoon. So we've got two persons business. We don't have any two business. So the next item is number six, draft notes, which is made beginning at page 76 of the pack. Are members content to note the minutes? Um, yeah. yeah. Sure, there's a bit of an echo. People on mute and stuff like that. Hi, uh, is everybody muted or is anyone? That better now. I was getting that as well. Okay, okay. Uh, everybody's content with the minutes. Matters are rising. So we have one item in matters are rising that had been mentioned last week by Mike and previously by Michelle. So we have to just in line with the sort of formal processes of the committee. When something like that, when something like this is being discussed, we have to make a decision to discuss it and then have formal notice and then we can make a decision today. So this is in relation to the proposal to rescind our earlier decision to report to the Assembly by summer of this year and instead to report after summer recess. So before I formally ask the question, at which point I think we need to take a vote or if there's consensus, my... My view of this, and I think I had said this earlier, I would be, I would prefer for us, us to go ahead with the earlier plan purely because I'm conscious that obviously summer recess is a six week, two month period. We've done quite a lot of work here. Everything's fresh in our head and we do have a two month period in which to, to report as per the draft that we had agreed that was uh, drafted by the clerk. So I would be scared that we're going to run uh, too late into time, but I want to open it here if people have views. Chair? Go ahead, yeah. Everybody well, jump. I'll the clarification and, and I'll ponder it and then I'll come back in properly. But um, could you just outline again what the actual motion would probably say at the end of June? You know, what, what would be the, the, the wording on the order paper, for example? I don't think we're there yet, Paula. It's just to have... So we had agreed a sort of format for a draft report uh, a few weeks ago. The clerk had drafted that and there were some amendments suggested the idea is that we would be, we would have that report and that we'd be presenting it to the to the assembly. I don't know how that whether that would be a formal motion. And I give my apologies here. I'm not just quite au fait with the the processes. I, maybe Caroline might advise. Yes, chair, that would be the formal report being laid with the assembly and reporting to the assembly. And after that, the committee would dissolve as an ad hoc committee. Sorry, Chair, can I come back in? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, right, so we, we had our, our summary, our draft summary of the evidence to that point. You're then going to add in probably the quantitative research that was presented at the start of the meeting, and then, then a sort of a summary of the stakeholder engagement, both at committee and like this evening, for example. So you're going to give us that report, then we have a debate on it, and then we're dissolved. Is that what you're saying? before we actually get our, the legal experts to come in and, as, as Monica had said last week, to sit and help us interrogate it. So, uh, the committee had decided back in February to report by summer recess. So the idea was that the committee would have the report com complete. On the, so having done all your deliberations, write the report, make all the decisions, make any recommendations, and report that to the 
family in line with the, the terms of reference of the committee. So I'm sorry. Committees published. I can't. I can't hear you, Caroline. I'm afraid. Neither can I. Aye, the volume's really bad. Let me see if I can. Uh, I'm not. Is that any? If I speak a bit louder, is that a bit clearer? A bit better. And um, yeah, so the committee had agreed in February to report by summer recess. So that would be taking the report, as you said, all that additional evidence to go into it, and then the committee would deliberate on it, um, make uh, decisions, make any recommendations, and report to the assembly. And that was the so that would conclude the committee's work. Does that clarify things for you, Paula? Um, yeah, sorry to talk it here, guys. Last sort of question. I suppose I'm a little bit unnerved by that, and that I, I thought what we would be doing is almost we would like you would have your second reading, in that we would sort of discuss the sort of general principles and emerging themes of what we have heard, and then allow us then at the far side of recess to sit down with the legal experts who have been um, prescribed in the new decade, new approach, and allow us to sort of digest it into something that's actually more. Um, concrete uh, uh, as a proposal going forward. I just don't know how we would get to that point, considering we've still a few more weeks left of um, sectoral evidence to gather. So I, I have no problem with the debate, but if, if it's about us almost having a final destination, I think it's far too premature. If, if I could come in, Chair, um, looking at the format for the report that we agreed, there's an executive summary. And there's also a chapter called Recommendations. Uh, and I do question whether we are ready to, to agree the contents of those chapters. The second point is, as we now know, the, the panel of five experts has been reduced to a panel of three. But we don't know who they are and we don't know when we're getting them. Um, Mulligan McWilliams, I'm not Labour, who made the point. She, she was at pains in her evidence to say, Take your time, you know, lock yourselves away, try and get some, some agreement. Um, so, since we agreed that we would debate it before recess, I think a lot has happened, uh, none of which lends itself to anything other than thinking again. Because I, I repeat, once we go public for the first time, I would like to think all seven of us are on the same page. Michelle, jump in. Yeah, Chair, and apologies. My um, device died in the middle of all of this today, mm -hmm. so I um, it seemed to overheat and disappeared, so that's why I wasn't really able to, to hear an awful lot or contribute either, but I'm on my phone. Um, I suppose really what Mike and um, Paul have said has sort of echoed what I've been saying for the last few weeks. I am concerned the fact that really all that we have been doing over the last number of months is sort of listening as opposed to actually having um, proper conversations um, as as a group. Um, and I know obviously COVID has, pre has presented a lot of problems around that as well, but I am cognizant of the of the comments which were made by Monica McWilliams a couple of weeks ago in relation to, to Russia and this. And you'll know, as the rest of us will be aware too, that we will have to take this back to our parties um which will, will take some time as well so i i am reluctant um for to be very prescriptive about june okay uh, Sorry, but, but, uh just, just keen to, to, to hear the, the, the views of other members on this i agree it would be extremely ambitious or optimistic to think that we will all be agreed by the end of june you know on what go, goes in here could we still aim for it? And if we don't, you know, it's not the end of the world. We have fallback, you know, but I think it is vitally important that we get this right rather than rushed without a doubt. But it, I have a feeling if we were to leave it till December, we'll still end up rushing it <laughs> in, in, in the last in the last wee while. But I think we should have maybe a focused and concerted effort to try and get it done sooner but if we don't it's it's certainly not the end of the world it could be pencilled in for then or whatever Emma yes Carol I, I mean I, I understand where people are coming from but 
Uh, I'm also suspicious that people are trying to uh, wind the clock down and not do anything. So um, if not June, when? Is it September? You know, so um, I'm just being straight here. And if, we, if all seven of us agree, then that's, that's been worth the wait. But I also know know what happens as well. Um, so I think we just need to be honest here. Yeah. Uh, Paula, just weigh in, folks. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Carol, I just I don't want to start a row over Zoom. I, I, I can absolutely assure you I'm not trying to wind the clock down at all. I want something that is robust. We haven't decided where we are in terms of the UN conventions. We are not, you know, what, what, is, what are we actually, what package are we putting forward to our parties to adopt or even a series of options? I just don't think we're at that point. No, I the legal experts might come in and work 24 hours a day for the next two months and, and be able to consolidate and um, amalgamate what all we've heard. That might be possible, but unless and until we actually have something that is really tangible that we can go and sell to our parties or present to our parties, then I think that we should wait until we have that that package there. But I'm certainly not trying to long finger this. I'd like this pushed along as, as much as anybody else in this committee. Okay. Taking all of that on board, um, I suppose because we have to make a decision here, and if we're going to, if we're going to rescind the earlier decision, um, and propose a new date, we should would be as well to do that now. Do people, do people have a, a view? Are we are? I know people are referring to worries people have about their parties. Do we want to set say September or October or what? Well, I, I don't think we're ready to set a date as such. And I think if the clerk could maybe reflect on some of the um, comments around, you know, how are we going to get to a place where we have a recommendation section or an executive summary or an options paper or, or you know, how, how can we get to that point as opposed to just a, a summary of all the evidence without any sort of consideration of it? So that, that's when I think we should be setting a date and that maybe that's up to the clerk to, to work through that and can consider that. Okay. Clerk, do you want to come in there? Because I know it's more of what I had initially thought this was a very much a movable feast, but it's more formal maybe than we had initially anticipated. So do, can you advise on that? Chair, yes. The, uh, what, what we could do is have a, a reporting, um, a, a sort of reporting strategy meeting at the start of the, when we begin and finish, conclude evidence. And at that meeting, take stock, have a look at the report, have a look at all the evidence amalgamated together. And perhaps at that point, then, um, see what would be feasible would be a further option. Okay. Sorry, um, Chair. I think it would be useful that that gentleman from Dublin, sorry, I've forgotten his name, um, or somebody like him to come up and facilitate the, that discussion and, and work through it. And I do want it to reflect very much in terms of the quantitative information we've been given i think that there's there is also that aspect to it as well you know to sort of overlay the two the quantitative and qualitative stuff we've received uh, just one more thought from me chair if, if, if i may I, I want to reassure carol that i'm not trying to run the clock down i personally uh, i'm in favor of bill of rights but i have to bring um, the party with me i would just be very concerned that, that we have a debate and a report and then a panel of experts comes in and says, actually, that's wrong. Okay. We don't, we don't agree. We advise differently. Okay. So it sounds then that people want to rescind the decision to report to the Assembly by summer recess of this year and to report to the Assembly in a forward work programme post that. Are, are members agree in that now? Um, Chair, yeah. I think, it, 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 uh, go ahead. So, well, I, I think it's also we really need to know when are we getting a panel of experts? Yes, we, but, we do. Yeah, in theory, we do what, you're, what you're suggesting is yes. Okay, so everyone's agreeing that as the first uh, point. 
Yeah. Do you want then, are you asking, Mike, should we write to the executive office again around the panel of experts? Yeah, I put a question in the other day and they just came back and said, um, it, they can't comment, the officials can't comment because it's still under consideration and it's not being progressed as expeditiously as anticipated or hoped. Chair, Chair as, as a way of a com compromise, um, I think we could possibly keep that date in the diary and then do almost like a, a short debate sort of as an update to the Assembly, but then give a sort of a home interpretation and, and view we done where we are and where we think we're heading. But it might be useful from um, keeping the rest of the Assembly off the board. Yeah, I don't want us to go around in circles here um, and the care can advise if we could do something like that. But I'm conscious as well that all the people that have engaged with us and we have set out a plan or a timetable and if we renege on that, then, you know, the, the community, I suppose, already is quite frustrated with this process and feels like they've been at this for years and not had any um, result or fruit at the end of that. C could we do something like a debate giving people an update as to where we're at or what we've done so far, Caroline? It's a decision really for members. Um, you know, it would be possible to do that, whether members um, think that that would be a, a constructive um, debate or whether it might be better to... It might be the opposite. A decision for members. Uh, I, think, I, think, I think you have to debate. You need to have something to do Is that not, you know... So we're in the process of trying to pull together something. I think to have that debate, you need to have something <laughs> that has been produced. You know, that sounds a bit rudimentary, but I think that's probably the case, is it not? Well, a presentation, Christopher, sorry, I didn't realise you were there. I didn't mean to exclude you. Um, I, I, you know, if, if we were able to update people as to what it was that we've, so in terms of even, you're calling it a debate, but if we had the results of the survey or the key themes that were out, produced from the, the stakeholder events that we were updating people that these are the key considerations at that stage, we would have had two months of no meetings that we might be able to have an idea at least of our key themes. I'm, I'm very conscious that obviously this, this meeting has been broadcast and um, we, we do have a community who are active on this issue and are frustrated, as I've said, and I would like to show, you know, that we're making progress and that we're, we're serious about this. Well, I don't think there's any doubt about the seriousness of it. I mean, it's a new decade, new agreement approach. I just think that it's important that if we're supposed to have a panel of experts and we're supposed to be going through processes, that we do that first and there's actual product at the end of the process. In terms of the, the active interest, I uh, accept, absolutely. There's active interest in this issue and it's been rumbling for uh, probably well, 20 years. So of course there's there's active interest. And I think within the community that is actively interested in it, the work of this committee has received a lot of attention. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I, I think what I've said in terms of <clears throat> I, don't, I just don't know whether the floor of the assembly is an appropriate place to be updating us, updating people on the work of the committee when we haven't actually produced anything yet. Yeah, this would be at the end of the, the two months. But can we, we've decided, we have agreed here that we're rescinding the decision. Can we make a decision then on whether or not we're in favour of some sort of a take note debate? Do people, even by a show of hands, or do people have views? Yeah, sorry, sorry, if I could just come in just to give a further option on that particular one. If the decision has been rescinded, um, whether members would prefer to wait until we begin um, deliberations and have a look at the report and have a look at the evidence to see whether, and you could decide at that point, then it would be time to report to the business committee and ask for a debate if that's what members wished if giving it a maybe a bit more time um, and deciding a bit further down the line um, would be a further option rather than having to decide that now. Um, what about, what can about, we do that? Well, what I was going to say, what about having some sort of an event in the, in the long gallery where the findings of the survey could be presented and assembly members would be able to go along and get the information and 
and you confront that up, Chair, you're also the chair of this committee, you might confront up some sort of an event and the presentation of the information that's been produced in the survey to better inform members of A, the work of the committee, and B, the findings that have been compiled together. And I think that's probably a, like an information event for members. I think it's probably more useful than a debate on the floor of the assembly at this juncture. We can put that as an option. So we we park it then and take a decision. That sounds if that was something feasible with COVID. I know that the stakeholder events should have been in that format, but COVID meant that that wasn't possible. Yeah. If we're in a stage of restrictions, that that perhaps could be something that's more practical or works better. So can we move on then to correspondence? Nobody's saying no. So uh, folks, you can find the correspondence memo at page 82 of your packs. Our members content to note. Okay. And then nine are forward work program. And again, we've made that um, decision. So our members content to agree the forward work program subject to the change agreed earlier in relation to the timing of the committee report. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody have any other business? No. Nope. Okay. Before we before I uh, close the meeting and say the the date, time, place, the next meeting, we're going to go into closed session for a very short period of time to discuss some uh, other committee business. So the date, time, place of our next meeting will be Thursday, the fifteenth of April at two p.m. because we have a fortnight of recess here, and we'll receive briefings at that stage from Dean Vera. Baird, QC, and Conan Gilga. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Yeah. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.